Well, praise the Lord. Amen. I'm going to do something this morning. Uh, it's not in my notes, but I want to uh, introduce you to a familiar spirit. Um, turn to 1 Samuel chapter 28. 1 Samuel 28. Now I'm going to read the, the text this morning. Um, I have developed this idea, and so far I've not, I mean, I've not discovered everything out of the Bible. Uh, we're going to be 1 first, first Samuel 28. 1 Samuel 28. I'll give you the verse here in a little bit. Um, but my, my theory that I've developed, boy, that snow's coming down, isn't it? Boy, it looks pretty, doesn't it? I love it. Anyway, the people up in Minnesota are laughing at us because it's only like this much. And the people in Florida are glad that it's us and not them. So anyway, um, my theory is, is that for every doctrine in the Bible, for every teaching, there's a story in the Bible somewhere that illustrates what it looks like. Okay? God, it's like God knew we were children. And children like to read books so long as there's pictures in it. Okay? When I went to the library in Festus Elementary School, I didn't, I didn't start out reading War and Peace. I still haven't read War and Peace. But there's no pictures in it. So I got books with pictures in it. The pictures help our young minds. We teach, we teach children letters and words by showing them pictures of the words. Because they can identify it that way. Well, God draws pictures in our Bible. And there's, there are the stories of what the doctrine looks like. And so, um, first, 2 Corinthians 11 Verse 4, Paul said, For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if ye received another spirit, which ye have not received, or another gospel, which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. And so, the other Jesus is, or the other spirit, is going to be a familiar spirit. It is not going to be the Holy Spirit of God, and he's not going to present... The, uh, the real Jesus, and he's not going to teach the real gospel. When we get into the gospel part of this, um, we're gonna, there, it's, identifying the real gospel is very, very easy. Okay? And uh, basically, does it involve a work or a performance or a payment or anything from this earth? Does it require anything from us uh, that would be a work of the law? And the answer is no. Our salvation comes by way of grace through faith. Belief is not a work. Belief is what goes on in your mind. You accept something as being true. That's not a work. And I, there's people that write me all the time saying, you believe in work salvation because faith is a work. No, it's not. Anyway, um, so... But in this particular case here, he tells us and warns us about another spirit. So, 1 Samuel 28, and I'll give you the background on this, okay? Saul had started out being a good guy. And he was prophesying when, when uh, Samuel anointed him. Saul prophesied with the prophets. And everything was going well, and he wanted to please the Lord, and... On and on and on. But then, uh, something in him never really, never, never really took place. The Bible says that um, in 1 Samuel 13, I believe it is, 1 Samuel 13, Saul actually disobeyed and disregarded the word of the Lord, decided to go on his own, and... Um, 
when Samuel confronted him about it, he lied about it. And he said, I have too kept the word of the Lord. And Samuel said, no, you didn't. How, if you did, how come I hear sheep in the background bleeding? What is this bleeding I hear? And um, so Saul never really backed down from, that, from his stand on that. And so Samuel said, because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, God has rejected thee from being king. And um, God had told David that he wasn't going to have mercy on Saul ever again. And Saul repented of what he had done, and Samuel said, too bad. Okay, God doesn't care if you repent now. It's too late. Now, I want to tell you something. I think trying to convince people that there's going to come a time when it's going to be too late to say, I'm sorry to God... I think that day comes, and it will come, Amen. okay? Amen. Uh, God's going to say, can't help you. I gave you space to repent, and you never did. So now the time of mercy is over. The time of repentance is over. I'm not going to hear it anymore. God shut the door of the ark plainly. God shut the door of the ark, and that was cutting everybody off from being sorry and repenting because when the rain comes down, that's too late to start repenting, Okay? So repent before the rain comes down, or the snow. Okay? So anyway, once that happened, the Bible says that the Spirit of the Lord left Saul, and an evil spirit from God uh, came, came to him. And so Saul was constantly harassed by this evil spirit, and affected, and his thoughts were affected by this evil spirit. So, um, and, and Saul actually said or excuse me, Saul, Samuel actually, there's too many S's in this story. Samuel actually said to Saul, rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as idolatry. And he said, you know, because you've rejected the word of the Lord. It's just like witchcraft is what it is. To me, that's interesting because that's where Saul ended up. That's where he ended up. So in 1 Samuel 28, uh, let's see here. Where do I want to start? Um, let's see, am I in 28? Yeah. In verse 6, the Bible says, And when Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord answered him not, neither by dreams, nor by Urim, nor by prophets. Now, very quickly, does anybody know what the Urim and the Thummim were? Neither does anybody else. Okay, we don't know what it is. We just know that it was a way at this time for Moses or let's say Aaron the high priest or whatever to discern the will of the Lord. It was some sign or something that was used to discern whether or not God was speaking. Okay? Uh, we have something better than that now. It's called Old Testament, New Testament. Okay? If you want to discern if God's speaking or not, read the Bible. That's God speaking. And so anyway, but the bottom line here is, God basically cut Saul off. And he was not going to answer him ever again, either by dream, or by Urim, or by prophet. Those three. God said, I'm not going to talk to you anymore. I'm done with you. Which then caused Saul to go seek out some other recourse. Okay? So, he goes to, verse 7, Then Saul said unto his servants, Seek me a woman that hath a familiar spirit, that I may go to her and inquire of her. And his servant said to him, Behold, there is a woman that hath a familiar spirit at Endor. And, I mean, I've said this before, but the name Endora from bewitched comes from this verse. The, the witch or the woman that hath a familiar spirit at Endor. How did, these, how did these people writing this script for this TV show know this? Okay. Huh? Familiar spirits? Possibly. Um, I know that back then in television, as there is now, a lot of Jews, a lot of Jews were are and have been responsible for putting shows on TV, for putting movies out, and putting music out, things like that. 
And uh, some of these are familiar with Bible passages, and whoever wrote the script for Bewitched knew this passage, okay? And introduced America to the woman at Endor. So, um, verse 8, Saul disguised himself and put on other raiment, went and two men with him, and they came to the woman by night, and he said, I pray thee, divine unto me by the familiar spirit, and bring me him up, whom I shall name unto thee. And the woman said unto him, and this is, this is very much like you going to the carnival, and there's a woman at the carnival show who does psychic readings and can communicate with the spirits of the dead, and she has a crystal ball, and this and that and the other, and you go in, pay her a large sum of money, and, and you say, I, I need to uh, get in touch with my Uncle Herbie because we found his safe but don't know the combination. We know he's got a million dollars in there. We want it out. So she gets in contact with Uncle Herbie. And a familiar spirit shows up who knows Uncle Herbie, was around Uncle Herbie when he was alive and can answer questions that only Uncle Herbie would know. So everybody's going, oh, that's Uncle Herbie. I mean, how did he know that? Okay. So anyway, that's how that works. Um, verse 9, the woman said unto him, Behold, thou knowest what Saul hath done, how he hath cut off those that have familiar spirits and the wizards out of the land. Wherefore then layest thou a snare for my life to cause me to die? And Saul swore to her by the Lord, saying, As the Lord liveth, there shall no punishment happen to thee for this thing. Now, guess what? Saul wasn't telling her the truth. Where is this woman right now? Okay. So verse 11. Then said the woman, Whom shall I bring up unto thee? And he said, Bring me up Samuel. And when the woman saw Samuel, she cried with a loud voice. And the woman spake to Saul, saying, Why hast thou deceived me? For thou art Saul. Now, she saw Samuel. But Samuel is dead. Samuel's dead. So, what some people believe, and I'm not, over, I'm not antagonistic to those who believe that this was Samuel. And you read a King James Bible. Because there's just enough in this passage to make you think that it could possibly be Samuel. But I'm going to lay out a case this morning. Something occurred to me this morning I never thought of before. Okay? So, the woman... The Endora believed it was Samuel. And she's going, you're Saul. Okay, she figured it out. In verse 13, the king said unto her, Be not afraid, for what sawest thou? Now this, is, this to me is very important. And the woman said unto Saul, I saw gods ascending out of the earth. Gods. Okay? Evil spirits. Little g, gods. Ascending out of the earth. And he said, and now, well, I'm going to wait till that. I'm going to lay out my case here in a little bit. And he said unto her, what form is he of? And she said, an old man cometh up and he is covered with a mantle, which means he had his, he had his hoodie on and he had it pulled down over his head like these teenage boys like to wear now, like pull that hood down over their head. And um, so anyway, Saul perceived that it was Samuel. But according to this, didn't see his face. It just looked like Samuel. The clothes, maybe the appearance of it, the deception, the spirit of it, and so on. But the mantle, he's covered with a mantle, so they probably couldn't see his face. So in... Um, Verse 14 again, so he stooped with his face to the ground and bowed himself. The real Samuel, I would say, would have never allowed Saul to bow before him. Okay? I would say that. Now, the Bible doesn't say that. But I would, that's just my thinking. Verse 15, Samuel said to Saul, Why hast thou disquieted me to bring me up? And Saul answered, I am sore distressed, for the Philistines make war against me. And God is departed from me, and answereth me no more, neither by prophets nor by dreams. Therefore I have called thee, that thou mayest make known unto me what I shall do. So verse 16, Then said Samuel, 
Wherefore then dost thou ask of me, seeing the Lord is departed from thee and has become thine enemy? And the Lord uh, has done, in verse 17, now this is still the familiar spirit known as Samuel talking. And the Lord hath done to him as he spake by me, for the Lord hath rent the kingdom out of thine hand and given it to thy neighbor, even to David. Verse 18, because thou obeyest not the voice of the Lord, nor executest his fierce wrath upon Amalek, therefore hath the Lord done this thing unto thee this day. Now a spirit could have known that. Now, verse 19. To me, verse 19, and I never, I never considered this until just this morning. Verse 19, to me, nails it. Moreover, the Lord will also deliver Israel with thee into the hand of the Philistines. And tomorrow shalt thou and thy sons be with me. The Lord also shall deliver the host of Israel into the hand of the Philistines. Okay. Then fell Saul, uh, Saul fell straight away all along on the earth and was sore afraid because of the words of Samuel. And there was no strength in him for he had eaten no bread all the day nor all the night. Now, why do I not believe that this was Samuel, but it was a familiar spirit? Okay? Numero uno. God had already let Saul know, and Saul knew it, that he was not going to speak to Saul ever again by one particular thing. And that was prophets. Samuel was a prophet. And any time God spoke to Saul, it was through Samuel, the prophet. And Saul was used to that. Saul regarded that. But now, as of this point, the prophets are not allowed to speak to Saul anymore and give him the knowledge of the Lord or the word of the Lord or whatever. They're, they're not, God is refraining them and restraining them from doing it. This then, in my mind, cannot be the real Samuel. If it was the real Samuel, he would be forbidden to speak to Saul. Does that make sense? God, Samuel, and even Saul said to the Spirit, God won't let the prophet speak to me anymore. That's why I called you up. And the Spirit said, why have you called me? God's not speaking to you by prophets anymore. They both agreed that that was God how God was treating Saul, that he wasn't speaking to Saul anymore by the prophets. And Samuel was a prophet. So to me, number one, this cannot be Samuel. It, and, and again, for those who still think this is Samuel, because the way, the way some of this is written, I mean, it doesn't say, and the spirit pretending to be Samuel said, it said, and Samuel said. So I can, I get it. And so I'm not antagonistic to anybody who doesn't agree with me on this, okay? But I think that in this story, God is showing you, number one, how familiar spirits work. Number two, that it's, you can be fooled. You can be fooled. Now, hold your place there in 1 Samuel Put your hand there, put a bookmark there or whatever, and turn to Deuteronomy 18. Deuteronomy 18. So yes, it's, we can be fooled. I was fooled before, especially when it pertains to the Bible. I was fooled into believing that any translation was okay. And, uh, and for a while, I fell for it. And God drew me out of that. God convinced me of it. So, the question arises then, is this Samuel? Is it not Samuel? And how can we even know whether it was Samuel or not? Is it going to remain just a big question mark that God is not going to show us until we reach eternity? Or is the answer right here okay and if you say to me well i feel like it was samuel i don't care how you feel your feelings mean nothing here 
Okay? Feelings, whatever. Uh, pastor's wife called me yesterday and really distraught over her sister. Her sister is saying to her, I feel like God is wanting me to do this, or I feel like the Spirit is leading me in this direction. And this particular pastor and his wife, I mean, these are Bible believers, and they know where this lady's headed, and they know for a fact that the Spirit is not leading this woman in this direction because it violates Scripture. They know it. But what th comes out of this woman is, well, I feel that it's this way. I feel like God's wanting me to do this. Take your feelings and get them out of the way, okay? So, how can we know whether this is Samuel or not? The Bible will tell you. So, in Deuteronomy 18, verse, um, verse 17, because God is telling them, in verse 17, The Lord said unto me, They have well spoken that which they have spoken. Verse 18, I will raise them up a prophet, a capital P prophet. And we had talked about that and on Wednesday night. This is Jesus. The, he is the high prophet. He's the big prophet of all prophets. Uh, from among their brethren, like unto thee, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. And it shall come to pass that whosoever will not hearken unto my words, which he shall speak in my name, I will require it of him. Verse 20, But the prophet which shall presume to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or that shall speak in the name of other gods, underline that, shall speak in the name of what, Jeremy? Other gods. What did this woman see popping up out of the ground, out of the earth? Other gods. She saw gods ascending out of the earth. Um, even that prophet shall die. Now verse 21, here's, here it is. And if thou say in thine heart, how shall we know the word which the Lord hath not spoken? So here's your answer. Verse 22. When a prophet speaketh in the name of the Lord, if the thing follow not, nor come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord hath not spoken. But the prophet hath spoken it presumptuously, thou shalt not be afraid of him. In other words, all he has to do is be wrong one time he just has to be wrong he can say five things four of them come to pass exactly the way he says it but if one of the things that he says is wrong and doesn't come to pass he's not a prophet of god doesn't matter how many times he was right god's standard is the highest of all standards and god doesn't say well three out of five is not bad or what you keep Four out of the Ten Commandments, that's fine enough. I mean, I'll take one or two, you know, sure. That's not God. God said keep all the commandments. God said it cannot be wrong or an error one time. Okay, so did you keep your place there in 1 Samuel? I didn't. 1 Samuel 28. Let's look at what this spirit said. Verse 19 of 1 Samuel 28. Moreover, the Lord will also deliver Israel with thee into the hand of the Philistines. And tomorrow, and this is, this is what I've heard from people. Well, yeah, it was Samuel because Samuel told him that he was going to die the next day. Okay? That's not what he said. Look at your Bible. Because that's what I thought, too. I thought, yeah, he did tell him he was going to die the next day. That's not what he said. What he said was, uh, And tomorrow shalt thou and thy sons be with me. Now, here's what we know from Luke 16. In the place, in the heart of the earth, before Christ died and ascended, everybody that died went to one of two possible places. Place number one was called Abraham's bosom. Lazarus, when he died, Luke 16, went to Abraham's bosom and was in comfort. Was he not? He was, a bosom is a place of comfort, okay? Um, Courtney was just holding um, Lawson a while ago and holding 
you know, she didn't have him down by her ankles, kick rolling him around on the floor. That's not very comfortable. She had him in her bosom. Okay, it's a place of comfort. That's where Lazarus was. This is where Samuel is, or was, in Abraham's bosom. The other place is where the rich man went. He was in torment in the flames. Remember that? They both died the same day. Lazarus goes to Abraham's bosom and is in comfort and has water. The rich man dies. He's in torment in the flames and has no water. And there's a great gulf fixed between the two so that Lazarus cannot go where the rich man is. The rich man cannot go where Lazarus is. That's very clearly spelled out in your Bible. So notice what this, what this spirit said. He said, tomorrow shalt thou and thy sons be with me. That is not true. Because if Samuel was, if this was Samuel, Samuel would be in Abraham's bosom. But Saul would not. Saul would not be in Abraham's bosom. God had rejected him. He's on his way to hell. And that's where he ended up. So that's, and I'm just, I looked at this just this morning, and I haven't really had time to really just nail this thing down. But then the next thing he said, the Lord also shall deliver. Now, let me also say this. Notice that he said, and tomorrow shalt thou and thy sons be with me. While it is true that three of Saul's sons were with Saul the next day and were killed. One son of Saul remained. He was Ishbosheth. He was the one that had been crippled. And Ishbosheth was put on the throne immediately after they found out about Saul's death. They put Ishbosheth on Saul's seat on Saul's throne over the rest of Israel while David was anointed to be king over Judah. And it wasn't until a few years later, I think seven years later, that David finally became king over the whole nation. So it wasn't quite true that all of Saul's sons went down with Saul. One of them remained alive. But then, uh, thy sons be with me, the Lord also shall deliver the host of Israel into the hand of the Philistines. Okay? Uh, verse, if you go back to the top of verse 19, moreover, the Lord will also deliver Israel with thee into the hand of the Philistines. I just kind of did like a scan of the chapters that follow this verse. And while the Israel, while the Philistines were able to kill Saul, kill his three sons, and make the armies of Israel flee, Israel was not put under the dominion of the Philistines at this time. That didn't happen, just from what I can see. Now, I'm going to study this out more to, to kind of nail this thing down. But I'm reading through passages here, and I'm looking for things, and I don't see the place where it says that Israel was under the dominion of the Philistines. Because it clearly says that David was enthroned as king over Judah. Ishbosheth was enthroned as king over the rest of the tribes of Israel. And they have, they have had war with the Philistines after that, but they were, not under, they were not delivered into the hand of the Philistines on that day. Do you see what I'm saying? So while it's true, part of what he said was true. There's things here that this spirit says that never happened. Didn't happen. Therefore, this is not the prophet Samuel. Because the prophet Samuel never lied. He never said it wrong. If Samuel said it was going to be this way, then it was going to be this way. And that's how we know. Now you take that then, and as we go back to 2 Corinthians, have it up there on the screen. He that cometh preaches another Jesus, and or if you receive another spirit, or another gospel. Any spirit that convinces you that your Bible is not true is not the Holy Spirit. It's not. And 
I was lied to. I was misled. I was following a spirit that was not the Holy Spirit of God in believing that my Bible had errors in it. That things in this book wasn't true, therefore they were not or could not be fulfilled. Okay? Bottom line is, was it the Son of God in that fiery furnace or a son of the gods in the fiery furnace? Which one? Okay? Uh, are there three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, the Holy Ghost, and these three are one, or does that not even exist? Okay? This kind goeth not out but by prayer and fasting. Is that true or is it not true? Okay? And if you've got a spirit telling you that those, and like this guy, he confronted me down in Gainesville, Missouri, holding a revival down there. I asked this man point blank, so do you believe that spirits do not require prayer and fasting to be cast out? And he said, no, somebody added that to the Bible. And I went, at least he was honest, okay? But a spirit has lied to that man and convinced him that his Bible had errors in it and he didn't have to believe it. That is not the spirit of God. It's a seducing spirit. It is a familiar spirit posing as the spirit of God. So yes, you can be fooled. But if you'll apply the principles in Scripture to what you're hearing, if you'll apply these rules, what God says about His Word and about the Spirit, to what you're hearing, and what you're hearing comes up short, then that's not the Spirit of God. It's very plain. Amen? Father in heaven, you make this book, this book's right. You make it real and you make it simple. You give us plain understanding, God, of things, Lord, that, Lord, even I, for a time in my life, I thought this was Samuel. And I know some good guys, Lord, that still believe this is Samuel. And I'm not, I don't want to be their enemy. I'm not trying to correct everybody. But the rules, Father, are, are plain to me. And Father, I hate lies. I hate them. I hate every false way. Because I know what it does to people. And I know that evil men, evil spirits, love to gain advantage over people, over humans, over mankind. And will do it by way of lies and deception, misleading. So Father, make us free by having us know the truth. And we won't, we won't be lied to by people. We won't, we'll know the truth. They won't be able to deceive us. They won't be able to fool us. Father, thank you for this book being right and everything it says. I love you, and I thank you for it in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen.